The Chris Knight theory is one of the most controversial theories in the Deltarune fanbase, and has been a hot topic of debate ever since Chapter 2 released. And today, I'd like to make the rare argument in favor of Chris being the knight. <laughs> Lies, I tell you, lies! My client is innocent of these crimes. And today, I will be disproving the Chris Knight theory. I will be systematically dismantling all the evidence that supports that Chris is the Knight. My client is innocent! Innocent! First, let's examine the evidence supposedly proving Chris is the Knight. So we don't know what Chris was up to before Deltarune's story started, since we obviously weren't in the picture. And since the Dark Fountain in the unused classroom was created before the story started, it is technically possible that Chris could have created that Dark Fountain. After all, they go to the school, they know its layout, they know that the unused classroom is a perfect place for a Dark Fountain since it's well unused, and wouldn't be easily discovered by someone else. When Susie and Chris discover the closet Dark Fountain, Chris backs away, Almost like they know what's inside. Almost like they've seen something like this before. When they enter the Dark Fountain, their costume looks like a knight, I guess. I don't know, like, <laughs> the fact that some people actually use this as actual evidence is kind of hilarious. Like, people be giving some, like, game theory-ass evidence, like... <laughs> but regardless of that, they're clearly a very determined person, meaning they are capable of making dark fountains. And of course, you know, there's the elephant in the room. Chris is the only person we see on screen make a dark fountain. <laughs> so what? Listen, if I were held accountable for all the stupid decisions I made as a kid, oh boy, wow. But in all seriousness, it's safe to say that when we first saw this happen, we were all like, damn, Chris is the knight, okay? <laughs> and for some people, that's still their opinion. But for most of us, after thinking about it for a little while, we realized that this doesn't prove anything. Just because Chris made a dark fountain doesn't make them the knight. Literally any lightener with above average determination can create a dark fountain. Arguing Chris is the knight because they made a dark fountain is like saying, Oh, you committed a violence. This obviously means you're the Riddler, the evil serial killer terrorizing the streets of Gotham. Being guilty of one crime doesn't automatically make you guilty of another crime. Chris opening a dark fountain doesn't mean they opened literally every dark fountain in the area. As for Chris's interesting reaction, it's actually pretty reasonable. Would you want to go into this cursed room? Even Susie hesitates before going into this closet. Does that mean she's the knight? But I admit, these facts alone don't exonerate Chris of being the knight. Yet. But through the power of logic, I will still prove that Chris is completely innocent. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I present Exhibit A. Means, motive, and opportunity. The state's case is built on a throne of lies, predicated on a flimsy timeline. I intend to systematically dismantle this case by focusing on the most important part of any night theory, which is means, motive, and opportunity. Now, what are these things? Well, means is a person's ability to commit the crime, motive is their reason for committing the crime, and opportunity is whether the person had a chance to commit the crime. Now, a majority of the knight's character is shrouded in mystery, but there are a few things we know for sure. Of course, this is assuming that Ralsei's and Queen's word is trustworthy. But according to Queen, only highly determined lightners can create dark fountains. This means that the knight is also a highly determined lightner. Since all of the worlds were created in hometown, it follows that the knight is also a resident of hometown. According to Ralsei, creating too many dark fountains can cause the roaring. And since the knight is called the Roaring Knight, it follows that their motive for creating all these dark fountains is to cause the roaring. And then there's the knight's opportunity. The knight is responsible for creating both dark fountains. So if a character had the opportunity to create one dark fountain but not another, then they aren't the knight. Now there's no dispute that Chris has the means and motive to create these dark worlds. I mean, we see them physically do it in front of us. And since Chris is mostly silent, it's impossible to glean what their motives and desires are. So sure, it is technically possible that they could want to cause the roaring. I mean, I don't know why a teenager would want to do that, but ignoring that, as for opportunity, that's where things get a little shaky. Like I've said before, they could have created the first Dark Fountain, but it's downright impossible for them to have created the second Dark Fountain. I present Exhibit B, the timeline. 
I want to add a disclaimer that this timeline is somewhat controversial and has even been debunked by Spooky Dude. But put your pitchforks down. I will address the criticism he has for this timeline. I just want to lay foundation first. Most people who believe Chris is the Knight believe that they made the Computer Lab Dark Fountain sometime after Chapter 1. At first glance, this does make sense. I mean, we see them take out the soul, so we obviously don't have control over them. We don't know where they're going. They take out their knife, which is the same weapon they used to create the Chapter 3 Dark World. We know from Toriel they were prowling around at night doing mischief and stuff. So I guess it is technically possible that they snuck out of the house, went to the library, and created the Dark Fountain. Except, is it really? Look how slowly Chris walks without the soul. When the soul isn't in their body, every single movement seems painful and arduous. In all other instances where Chris removes their soul, they put it back in shortly after, which would imply they can't go for very long without it. And considering how slow they move, it'd probably take a couple of hours to get to the library. Would they even be able to do that physically? I mean, if you believe that Chris is a knight, then you believe that they somehow shuffled all the way to the library at one mile an hour, broke into the library, opened the dark fountain, covered up the burglary so well that there's not a single shred of evidence indicating the library was broken into, shoveled back home, ate an entire pie, plugged in the TV, and went to bed? Like, <laughs> no wonder they're so exhausted at the start of chapter two. Like, now, is it possible that Chris did all this in one night without getting caught? Mm. Meh, sure. Is it extremely funny to imagine Chris doing this all in one night without getting caught? Yes. But none of this really matters because the Dark Fountain was clearly created the day after. Here's why. Look at where Burley and Noel are sitting after the Dark Fountain is sealed. They're sitting at the table with their heads in their hands. Now let's say for a second that this Dark Fountain was created the night before. That means when they got to the computer lab to study, it looked like this. Now being faced with this situation, instead of deciding to study literally anywhere else in the library, they decide, yep, I'm going to study in a pitch black room. Walking inside, instead of looking for like a light switch or something, they somehow stumble their way to the seat farthest most from the door. They sit down, take out their books, and then just fall asleep. And somehow they do all this without falling in the dark world. In general, the insides of these rooms aren't consistent with what they looked like before the Dark Fountain was opened, meaning it'd be virtually impossible for Noel and Burley to traverse this room to the very back seats which is where they were sitting when the Dark Fountain was closed. Just look at what happens when Chris and Susie enter the classroom Dark Fountain. I assume this room is pretty small, like it's definitely not as big as it appears to be, which would imply that these rooms have some sort of non-Euclidean geometry. I mean, they walk forward in a straight line for a really long time, like... <laughs> So, I guess if Burley and Noel somehow managed to walk in a straight line for ages, maybe they could reach the end, but like at that point, you've already fallen into the dark fountain. Like, admittedly, it's unclear how these rooms work. Like, do you immediately fall in after you enter, or does it take a little bit before you fall in? But regardless of that, this situation just doesn't really make a lot of sense from a logic perspective or a character perspective. Because is it really in character for Noel to walk inside this room? Like, just look at the way Chris and Susie react to one of these rooms. Both both characters are significantly braver than Noelle, and even they're not thrilled to go into one of these rooms. But sure, Noelle, who is afraid of her own shadow, is just gonna walk into this room. So yeah, if the computer lab Dark Fountain was created the night after Chapter 2, then there's just like a massive gaping plot hole in the story. But obviously that's not what's going on. The game heavily implies that the Dark Fountain was created while Birdly and Noel were inside the computer lab. If you go into the closet, it says it's a closet. A large person could easily fit inside. What purpose does this line serve other than to tell us that the knight was hiding in the closet? Clearly that's the implication. And why would the knight need to hide in a closet if no one was inside the computer lab? I mean, come on, if Chris actually did open this dark fountain the night before, why were they hiding in the closet? Like, <laughs> that is kind of funny to imagine. Like, is this an introvert thing? I'm harping on this point because it destroys the Chris is the night theory. Let's just play the beginning of chapter two to illustrate my point. Okay, Burley and Noel are still in class, so the dark fountain hasn't been created yet. All right, Noel is still here, still no dark fountain. She leaves. So now the window of opportunity for this Dark Fountain's creation has begun. Alrighty, and... Oh. Chris is on screen for the entire time, and has no opportunity to make the fountain. So yeah, it's like physically impossible for Chris to have made this Dark Fountain. Now does this absolutely 100% disprove the Chris Knight theory? Yes! It is possible that Toby Fox intends for Chris to be the knight, and there's a minor plot hole in the story. But don't tell me that it's technically possible for Chris to be the knight, when there needs to be an actual plot hole in the story in order for Chris to be the knight. 
I mean, a plot hole is literally when something impossible happens in a story, so it is quite literally impossible for Chris to be the knight. Just to recap, my proposed timeline for chapter 2 goes like this. In the early morning hours, Chris removes the soul and shovels around their house. I'm not going to claim to know everything they did that night, but they definitely did not go to the library and create a dark fountain. Most likely, they plugged in the TV and watched a TV show while they ate their butterscotch pie. Then they go back to sleep. When they go to school, they basically sleep through the entire school day because they were up all night. After school, Chris and Susie go to the back closet. They have a short conversation with Noelle. Noelle leaves to go study with Birdley and Chris and Susie go into the dark world. During this time, Noelle and Birdley fall asleep while studying. The knight, who was presumably hiding in the closet, opens a dark fountain in the computer lab. Chris and Susie leave the dark world and go to the library and then the rest of the plot happens. But what happened to the knight? How did they get away without being spotted? Especially when there was this huge traffic jam outside. Well, who says they left the library? They probably just entered the dark world with Noelle and Birdley, manipulated Queen into using them as pawns, and then left when they felt their work was done. They probably left sometime after Chris and Susie entered, but before they closed the dark fountain, because obviously when they closed the dark fountain, they're not in the room, which means they had left before. Now that I've laid out the timeline, let's look at Spooky Dude's video. So this video takes a skeptical view on the Chris is not the knight theory. He's not necessarily saying they are the knight, just that they can't be ruled out. And the main way he does this, and the way that's most relevant for this video, is by attacking the commonly accepted timeline I just laid out. Now, I could just paraphrase this video, but I think you should hear it from the horse's mouth, and I'll interject to counter his points. I do want to include a disclaimer that I'm not like a spooky dude hater. Don't get me wrong, I wake up early so I can hate longer. But I don't hate his video, I'm not doing this to criticize him or anything. In fact, I've spoken to him, I have his blessing to use this video in my video. The reason I'm using his video is because I think he makes the strongest points supporting that Chris is the knight. So if I can debunk his points, I think that adds a lot of credibility to my video. Big ups to Spooky Dude for letting me use this video, let's go. The main argument that goes into this timeline is that when we close the chapter 2 Dark World, Noelle and Birdley close up their books. This implies that at some point they opened their books and began studying. The implication is that the Dark World must have opened after they started studying because otherwise why would their books be open? Now here's my suggestion. Is it possible the Dark World doesn't have to act in one specific way? and it was actually opened the night before. Is it possible that Noelle and Birdley's books were opened not because they started studying, but instead because Toby wanted Noelle and Birdley to reasonably believe they were dreaming? So the question is, would Toby Fox create a plot hole in his story to explain why Noelle and Birdley think they are dreaming? And I guess the answer is yes, theoretically, it is possible he made a mistake while writing the story. But I think that this reasoning is kind of dangerous because it can be used to justify any theory whatsoever. Sans is Ness. Wait, but this doesn't make any sense. It kind of contradicts everything that has been established about this character. Eh, maybe Toby Fox forgot the details of his own story and also the story of Earthbound and made a mistake. You see what I mean? Now I know you're saying, Spooky Dude, you really think Toby would include random details that he hasn't entirely thought through? And like, yeah, I said in the past there's a ton of random little details that don't mean anything, but that's beyond the point. I completely agree. Toby Fox does include random details in his story that don't mean anything. But this is not a random detail. This is a major plot point. Let's say that Chris is the knight and this is later revealed in the story. This minor detail would completely ruin the replayability of these games. One of my biggest story pet peeves is when a story has a really good twist, but then when you rewatch or reread the story, it doesn't really make any sense, like there are details that don't quite line up and it just makes you realize that the author did not plan out the twist beforehand and just wrote it on the spot. Like, imagine a player replays this game after it's revealed that Chris is the knight. They would reason that Chris opened that fountain after chapter 1 ended during the night and they would think to themselves, huh, that means when Burley and Noelle got to the library, they entered from here. So how did they get so far in here? Like, it would just be very bothersome to anyone who knows a lot about the story, which is most of the fan base. And this is something Toby Fox knows, so I just don't imagine him making such a sloppy and obvious mistake. The fact that the main character of his magnum opus is secretly the main villain is the most important detail in the story, and is a detail that would have the most amount of scrutiny. So every detail related to this knight subplot needs to be rock solid in order for this story to work. And he's been writing this story for over 10 years. I'm pretty sure he wouldn't let such an obvious plot hole slip through the cracks, especially this early in the story. 
And besides, he doesn't even need Noel and Bertley to be inside the computer lab, sitting at the back table in order to make it believable that they thought that Chapter 2 was a dream. I mean, even Susie questions if what happened during Chapter 1 was a dream. And the way that she entered the Dark Fountain leaves no doubt that what she experienced was real, unless the entire day was some sort of delusion. So yeah, if Bertley and Noel believe that their adventures in a computer-themed Dark Fountain filled with inanimate objects come to life was a dream, I don't think that'd be a hard sell to the audience. Why would the knight be hiding in the closet? I don't know, why would Chris walk to the other side of town, break into the library just to open a dark fountain in the computer lab of all places? Why does the game heavily imply that the knight hid in the closet in the computer lab? Was it to be a red herring? What's the point of having a red herring if you're going to reveal that Chris is the knight like five minutes later? Before I debunk this timeline, I'd also like to point out that this supposed timeline is so insanely odd and based on so many coincidences. Were they specifically waiting for Noelle and Birdley to arrive? That must be the only answer seeing that they have no problem creating the Dark World once they're here. Not only that, but Noelle and Birdley completely missed the knight creating the fountain and running through the room? Who says that they were awake during the fountain's creations? I mean, their heads were lying in their hands, implying they were asleep. So I don't think it's an unreasonable assumption to think that the knight opened the dark fountain while they were asleep in the computer lab. And don't tell me that would have woken them up, because Chris literally does the same thing with Toriel and Susie. They were asleep, and that didn't wake them up. Editing me here. So I just realized that I didn't address his first point at all, like where he's like, oh, why is the knight waiting in the closet? Were they waiting for Burly and Noelle to show up so they could trap them in there? And I actually have a whole video on my channel on why I think that that is the case, that they were purposely trying to trap Burly and Noelle in there. And I'm not going to go into the whole details of it, otherwise this video would be like 20 minutes long. So basically, at the start of chapter 1 when Susie and Chris go into the closet, the door just kind of closes behind them and there's no explanation given for why that happened. And basically, the only explanation that makes any sense is that someone was waiting outside for someone else to go into the closet so they could close the door on them and trap them in the dark world. And of course, the only person who would know about this dark world's existence would be the knight or someone working for the knight, which would imply that at least one of the knight's motive is to trap these people in the dark fountain. So obviously, the same logic would apply to Burley and Noelle. They just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time while the knight was waiting to ambush someone and open this dark fountain. Now, what motive would the knight have to do this? Well, you're just gonna have to watch my video. The link is in the description. But yeah, let's get back to the video. Some people use traffic jam as an excuse to explain how the night managed to sneak away, but I feel like that it has the opposite effect. The giant traffic jam stopped us from going anywhere. Wouldn't the night be immediately seen and have a hard time escaping? Not only that, but Rousey only notices the dark presence after we leave the Castle Town Fountain. Are you saying that in the literal minute between us leaving the school and entering the library, all of this happened? This same argument can be used to disprove the Chris Knight theory though. I mean, you're kind of assuming that the disturbance Rousey felt was the Dark Fountain opening, but I think that is a reasonable assumption to make, so let's assume that that's true. If the Dark Fountain was created by Chris the night before, why is Rousey only feeling the disturbance now? Why didn't he feel it the night before when it actually happened? But let's ignore that. This still doesn't prove that the Dark Fountain wasn't created after Chris and Susie left Castletown. Listen, Rousey is completely trustworthy and never lies, but maybe on this occasion he was withholding the truth. He does have a tendency to withhold important and upsetting information, so it's quite possible that Rousey felt the disturbance while Chris and Susie were in Castletown and didn't say anything because Chris and Susie were having fun and he didn't want to kill the vibe. He only left to investigate after they left, and when he finds them in the Dark Fountain, he's like, oh! <laughs> Funny seeing you here. I like actually totally felt a disturbance in the forest like five seconds after you left. But let's even ignore that and accept that the Dark Fountain was created after Chris and Susie left Castletown. This still doesn't prove that it's impossible for the Knight to create the Dark Fountain in this time period. In fact, I timed it. So I timed how long it took for Chris to create their Dark Fountain and it took like 7 seconds. And then I timed how long it took Chris to go from the closet to the library. Now I know some of you may be saying, oh you were totally cheating, you totally went slower than you could just to prove your theory correct. But worry not, I deployed elite speedrunning strats to try to get to the library as quick as possible. I matched the enter key as fast as I could to try and skip all the dialogue. Autorun was on, I tried to get to the library as quick as I possibly could. And let's look at a comparison of the two times. Yeah. <laughs> 
So yeah, the knight could have easily created a dark fountain in this time period with a lot of wiggle room in between. Of course, this is all assuming that the way we experience time is the same way that the characters experience time, which is probably not true. Like, I'm pretty sure the way we experience time is significantly shorter than in-game time. Because in chapter 1, Susie and Chris spend the entire school day in the dark fountain, which is around 7 to 8 hours. Despite the fact that we the players can complete the game in under 30 minutes. So yeah, it's very possible that in game it took Chris like 5 minutes to get from the school to the library despite the fact that we experienced it only taking like 20 seconds, which gives the knight plenty of time to create a dark fountain in this time period. There's a very specific detail in game that seems to prove that this timeline can't be correct and it's sweet cap and cakes. Let's go over how time works in the dark worlds. In the dark worlds, time may run at any rate. It's also known that dark worlds exist prior to their fountains being open. Even if it is a case of last Thursdayism, which means that when you open the fountain, their histories are fake and created at that moment, what we do know is that prior to being opened, a dark world can go at any speed possible. However, once we enter the dark world, time mostly runs parallel. In chapter one, it was at the we, we entered the dark world and left, and it was a relatively believable amount of time that had passed. Same with chapter two. It's not like we entered there and left weeks later. We entered and left on the same day after spending a believable amount of time in the dark worlds. Now let's go over something sweet Cap and Cake say when asking them about the queen. Queen wasn't always so harsh. No, she was. She just got worse somehow. It wasn't until that dark fountain showed up that she started going into overdrive. Night this, night that, fountain that. Like, what does that night even have going for it that I don't? Now, how does that debunk the timeline? Well, this wording clearly shows it has been a little while since the fountain opened in the Cyber World's time. They established that Queen has been noticeably different and has spoken about the night and the fountain. That's not something that could happen in the span of five minutes, and it's probably not something that could happen in the span of a day, let alone a week. Assuming that it'd take the Sweet Cap and Cakes an entire week to notice that Queen was different is, well, erroneous. Admittedly, it's kind of unclear what kind of relationship the Sweet Captain Cakes have with Queen, but they clearly know her well enough to know when she's not acting like herself. So imagine you have a friend or an acquaintance that you know pretty well. Sure, they have their flaws, but they genuinely care about the people around them. Now imagine they start to change. They go from a flawed and paternalistic ruler to an outright dictator who's constantly rambling about the shadow of the knight's hands. Would it take you an entire week to notice that they were different? Would it even take you a couple of days? It'd probably take you a matter of hours to notice they were different, especially if the change is as drastic as the sweet cap and cakes are making it seem. But okay, maybe Spooky Dude is saying that it'd take more than a couple of hours for Queen's personality to drastically change, which, you know, is a good point. After all, these things don't happen overnight. But here's the thing, the Sweet Cap and Cakes were not talking about Queen's personality. They acknowledged that she was harsh to begin with. What they are talking about is her brand new obsession with the knight. Queen wasn't always so harsh. No, she was. She just got worse somehow. It wasn't until that dark fountain showed up that she started going into overdrive. Night this, night that. Clearly the knight's manipulation is what's making her personality worse, but okay, you may be saying how does this invalidate his point? It's not exactly realistic that the knight could have done all this in a couple of hours. Is it though? The fun gang spin at most a couple of hours in the Cyber City Dark World, and still, they're able to mow down loads of enemies, overthrow the government, close the fountain, and have whole ass character arcs along the way. The knight is clearly very powerful and likely very manipulative, so manipulating Queen wouldn't be that hard, especially when her blind spots are so massive. Oh, and one last thing before I let his next point play. If we're gonna bring up random, obscure lines of dialogue to prove our points, oh ho 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 Behold, the knight, the roaring knight, today! it deigned to create this world. Reaching its long hand into the sky, it coursed its will into its blade. But hey, like I said, even once the fountain is open, time might still run very fast. The only time it runs parallel is when we're inside, as has already been established. So maybe once the fountain opened, since nobody was inside... Oh, wait a minute. But according to the timeline, Birdly and Noel were there for the fountain's conception. Now are you starting to see it? If so much time has gone by that there's a notable shift in Queen's personality, Noelle and Birdly couldn't have been there the moment the fountain opened. Otherwise, they've been in there for a matter of a week, or maybe multiple weeks. So, time runs faster in the Dark World, 
after it's been created but before someone has entered it and after someone has entered it it somehow detects this and time starts to move in parallel with the light world i feel like the only reason this was brought up was to cover the plot hole created by the erroneous assumption that it'd take the sweet cap and cakes an entire week to notice that queen was different a few days to a whole week needs to have passed in order for these lines to make sense oh wait if this is the case that means chris can't be the knight because under that theory the dark fountain was created the night before which means it's at most a day old hmm maybe time Time runs faster in the dark world when these very specific conditions are met. There we go. In all seriousness, I guess it's possible that this assumption is correct, but there's no evidence that it's true. In fact, I could easily use it to explain my theory and why a week supposedly passed in the dark world despite it only being 15 minutes old. How could the knight have manipulated Queen over a whole week when the dark fountain is only 15 minutes old? Well, you know, time runs faster, I guess. But let's accept the premise that time in the dark world goes faster right after it's been opened but before someone enters it. And let's say that it did take the night at least a few days to change Queen's personality. This still means it's extra impossible for Chris to be the knight, because if Chris did open the fountain the night prior, they'd still need to enter it in order to interact with Queen. Now it's possible they didn't speak to her extensively, but they'd still need to interact with her to some extent. After all, the only reason her behavior changed is because Chris supposedly planted the seed in Queen's mind that opening these dark fountains would make people happy. Once Chris steps foot in the dark world, time would move in parallel with the light world, and assuming Chris went in immediately after Queen the dark fountain this means that the dark fountain is still less than a day old because when they enter it time is now moving in parallel with the light world how could chris have spent days manipulating queen when chapter 2 begins in less than 24 hours that's all you need to hear from spooky dude's video shout out to him for letting me use some of his clips the link to his video is in the description below he goes into a lot more detail on different aspects of this theory so make sure to give his video a watch but the only point that's really relevant to this video is the timeline because at the end of the day the timeline that i laid out earlier in this video outright debunks the Chris Knight theory. So unless holes can be poked into this theory, Chris is just straight up innocent. It's straight up impossible for them to be the knight. And while he did bring up some good points, like the sweet capping cakes and stuff, most of it could be pretty easily dismissed on further inspection. So I'd say that my timeline still holds up and Chris isn't the knight. Of course, there's always the possibility that there's just a plot hole in the story. But as I stated earlier, this isn't really a good basis to base a theory on because you could use it to justify any theory whatsoever by just saying, oh, it's a plot hole. Until we see more of the story, saying that there's a plot hole is just kind of a baseless assumption. So yeah, if there's anything that I missed or left out, make sure to leave a comment telling me about it. This is the end of the video, but what do you guys think? Do you think Chris is the knight or someone else? Sorry for the, uh, poor uploading schedule. I think I need to lay off on, like, the fancy editing techniques. These things take forever. But if you enjoyed the video, like, comment, and subscribe. And if you enjoy Deltrune Theories, I have four others on my channel. That's all I have to say. Bye-bye.